Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 44 of the All Dolphins podcast for Tuesday, August 15th. Today, Omar and I will be flying to Houston for the joint practices with the Texans ahead of the preseason game on Saturday afternoon. As always, we're on YouTube on, on the All Dolphins podcast and wherever you get your audio podcasts on the Fans First Sports Network. Omar, how you doing? No fancy name for player number 44? Rob Conrad, how's that? All right, I shall accept that. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could do this every day. Uh, you, probably, actually. And it's interesting. You might that struggle Rob, in your mid-40s. Sorry? I said, I think you might struggle in your mid-40s. Yeah, Maybe yeah, players, yeah, not, yeah, not like. I may have to rely on John Lovett, the Dolphin fullback. They just waved injured. So. Um, yeah. Okay, what do we got today, Omar? I think we're answering fan questions today, right? Yes, man. Yes, yes, sir. Um, let's get to it. It's a it's a healthy list that's pretty impressive. Um, I'm dying to get to one of these questions, but I, I, I'll I'll pace you and let you guess which question that is. Um, let's start with unst- unstoutable ask. Do you think Cook will sign with the Dolphins? Which we've answered every week. Uh, I know. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to make it brief. Uh, I'm going to say 41, 51, 49. Yes. Because eventually he's going to be like, I want to play. I'm not getting a big offer and I want to play for Miami. I'm in the agreement with you. As long as the, the starting back doesn't go down, um, the closer we get to the regular season, I, 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 I think he probably signs week two. Okay. Um, Remy asks Remy Los Salts. <laughs> <laughs> Remy le saut. Le saut. Remy le saut? Okay. Um, after watching the first preseason game, I was disappointed with Tan- Tyndall's performance. The numbers are good, but the read and reaction time aren't. Am I right? He's not wrong. He's not wrong. And that's that's always been the book on Tyndall. Uh, off the charts, athleticism. And in fact, that was Daniel Jeremiah's scouting report on NFL.com, or I, I don't know where he had it coming out of Georgia that again, athleticism off the charts, not terribly quick in the, in the reaction. And that's kind of important when you're playing linebacker. He, he I'm going to, for those who are UM fans, I'm going to correlate him to a guy named Leon Williams, who had a nice, healthy, long career in the NFL. I think with the Cleveland Browns, big physical stud, um, can lay the wood, Kidder, and I I do like Channing Tindall as a rusher. I think I think potentially if he was moved to the outside, he might have a little bit more success. But that might require a little bit more thought to it to to it than inside linebacker. But yes, a lot of false steps, a lot of misassignments, a lot of not knowing your responsibility, and eventually that's going to get get you caught up. Um, Ant Man, you got um. You guys should cross-reference similarities and differences between Miami and Philly. Do we stack up? Do we have enough? Sorry. Absolutely not. And uh, the, the biggest difference is the offensive line, where Philly's is the standard. You ask any NFL analyst, the reflex reaction, what's the best offensive line in the NFL? Philly, Eagles, Philly. It's always that. And they're stacked everywhere, and they just keep stacking. It's like – I mean, it's crazy. Their GM makes trades to pick up additional players, and they always seem to wind up, especially lately, with like studs that fall for some reason. The latest example is Jalen Carter, who, in terms of pure physical ability, was easily a top five pick this year, if not top three. Kind of slid because of the unfortunate accident he was involved in and that whole mess. And boom, the Eagles, like the Eagles defensive end, defensive line wasn't stacked enough before. Now they get another sudden. And last year, they get Nakobe Dean, who was a fabulous college linebacker, a bit on the short side. That scares a lot of teams away. They wind up getting him. And guess what? Look how good that guy's going to be. And they do not stack up. They don't stack up with the Chiefs. They don't stack up with the Eagles. I would argue to you that they don't stack up with the Bills talent wise. Unfortunately, I think Dolphin fans were sold a lot of hope and a lot of hype. And especially without Jalen Ramsey, this team, to me, shelf life is is 10 wins right now. But now that my opinion can change based if they 
turn on the light switch and all of a sudden start busting it open, wide open on offense. But I don't know if that's going to happen. Miller Stan asks, with the team now being in a win-now mode, why the lack of trade-ups in the past few drafts to address glaring needs the team has if they want to go to a Super Bowl? Trade-ups with what? They didn't have any picks to trade up. They 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 used their picks to get Tyreek Hill, to get Jalen Ramsey, to get Bradley Chubb. I mean, it's, it's, they used their draft picks to get stud players. And, and I, I want to please remind fans that the value of draft picks isn't that you just get young talent on your team. It's also that you get young, cheap talent. Mm, yes. And have them locked up for four years on mm -hmm. cheap rates like Raquan Davis and 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 Rob Hunt, where they're making one point four million dollars a year, as opposed to seven, eight, or nine, based on the fact that they've earned that. Um, so you really need to have those draft picks, and I think the Dolphins would be making a mistake if they continue to do that trade draft picks because this this con this 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 roster is getting more expensive by the day. Um, Brian Anderson, while it's early in the preseason, is it necessary for the Dolphins to use three roster spots on a QB? I'll let you tackle that one. Yes, unequivocally, undeniably, indubitably, yes. Again, for those who are not aware, there's a new role in the NFL. Teams can have a designated emergency quarterback on game day who will not count against one of the allotted players, active players, but that, that quarterback has to be on the 53. So it makes no sense to have two quarterbacks and then put yourself in a position where if a catastrophe happens, like happened to San Francisco last year in the NFC championship game, you don't have a QB. Yeah. Why would you not carry? And again, the cost of carrying a third QB is the 53rd player on your roster, which chances are is going to be a special teams player. With He's not even on game day roster. Correct. Yeah. Um, Brooklyn Core asks, this is really for next season, but I'm worried. With so much cap problems, would we would we see like a partial rebuild next season? I feel like we, we went all in and reached on max talent that we can't afford this season. Yeah. I think his statement is absolutely accurate. Um, it's something that I tried to address this offseason that got fans all upset. And in panties in a bunch, they were bothered that I was bringing up the $32 million of debt, pointing out that they were living off credit card debt. And eventually the interest and and, and the charges are going to add up and you're going to be owing twice as much. Next season, let's for, say, for instance, okay, I'm, I'm just going to do simple math for you. You're $32 million over the projected salary cap. You got 13 million of carryover cash right now. That's that's going to bring it down a little bit. You're going to waive Emmanuel Ogba. You're probably going to waive Jerome Baker, and that's going to get you like 15 million dollars over. Okay, now let's let's do a little bit more math. You're 15 million dollars over. You're probably going to try to restructure Jalen Ramsey, who's coming off a, a a knee injury, to get yourself some 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 space. Get yourself that 15 million dollars. Okay. That's just going to get you at baseline if you felt comfortable restructuring a guy off coming off a knee injury, which I don't know how I feel about that, but you know, that's, that's, that's your decision to make. Um, you're Chris Greer. So let's say you're just baseline at even right now. You have signed absolutely nobody at baseline. So where are you going to get the money to sign Christian Wilkins? Where are you going to get the money to sign Robert Hunt? Where are you going to get the money to sign Raekwon Davis? Where are you going to get the money to sign Zach Sealer? Where are you going to get the money to replace Jerome Baker as inside linebacker? Where are you going to get the money to replace Jason Sanders? You can't do that all with draft picks. So it's no. going to be, if they don't win at a super high level and encourage Steve Ross to just push that credit card debt another year and max it out however he can, yeah, you're going to be rebuilding. You, you are without a doubt going to be rebuilding. I think they might have one more year where they can do a lot of restructures and then and then cut some of the fat. A lot? Who? Well, Who's a lot? I'm sorry? Who's a lot? Where, where else can they restructure? Okay, maybe I don't, Xavier. I don't I don't have the list in front of me. They have they have restructurable contracts beyond what you mentioned. And you mentioned Okay, you're gonna restructure Tehran again? 
uh, you're going to restructure you can't, Tyreek you can't restructure again? Somebody who's got a short shelf life that that you can't do. Um, but I looked at it before. There, there, there are ways to create cap space where I think they can get their nucleus is going to be there. I think they have another year of quote unquote without the ability to go out and get big time players like they've done. But I think yeah. I think the window is more this year and next, and then after that, there's going to be some a lot of painful moves and big names who could be on the move. It's going to be sooner than you think. Watch. Um, Fins up asked. We have one of the best defenses on paper. Will Fangio hiring turn up the volume and make this a top 10 scoring defense? This is from Fins up 22. Do you believe they are a top 10 defense? Borderline without Ramsey. I would have told you yes with Ramsey. I would tell you now maybe uh, if all things go well. And But again, I'm not going to play the card of if you avoid key injuries because you could say that with everybody. Um, because again, but they're very, very thin. If the guys stay healthy other than Ramsey, obviously, I do think they have a shot. I don't think it's a slam dunk or a strong possibility like it was before. You need three players to ball out to have a top 10 defense, in my opinion. You need Javon Holland, you need Xavier Howard, and you need Christian Wilkins. If those three players ball out, you have the potential to have a top 10 defense. But if you suffer an injury to a key player, like mm -hmm. a Jerome Baker, like uh, a Zach Sealer, I'm not even naming the three players you need to ball out. You might be in the bottom 16. I would add one more, one more to your list of three players I need to ball out. And I'll be generous. It's going to be an either or. They need e either Bradley Chubb or Jalen Phillips to ball out as an outside edge rusher. Oh, absolutely. No question about it. Um, I do not disagree with you. Jay Cutler, who it's not the real Jay Cutler. Um, he asked, what Don't happens? Care. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> what happens if Alex Ingle misses significant time? How much trouble is Miami in? Mm. They're not. I mean, come on, dude. I love Alec Ingle. Great guy, good player, will give you everything, good blocker, can catch a ball out of the backfield. Again, to use a quote you love, let's not pretend that the offense runs through Alec Ingold. Come on. If the pass pro is if the pass pro is adequate and Tyreek and Jalen Waddle get open the way they got open last year, Alec Ingold could sit out the entire year. And by the end of the year, people will be like, I'm sorry, Alec, who again? Come on. No offense. Yeah, if you have a replacement for him, no, not not even. If you have, oh, if you have a kid, because again, to me, he is down the list of guys. We mentioned the guys who need to ball out on off on defense. If you go, if we're going to do that on offense, Alec Engel is pretty low down the list. Okay, that's fair. Um, I will say this though, in his defense, he's my number two tight end. He's my H back. He's my fullback. Okay. He's my play action ace. Um. Do you think you think a fake handoff to Alec Ingle really, really? No, no, no. He's in the backfield. Defense? He's he's leaking out. He's in the backfield. He's moving yeah, but the up. The play to... fake doesn't the freeze the defense. I mean, no offense to Alec Ingle. Yeah, yeah, but he's the outlet. He's the outlet weapon, yes. and the, good pass catcher. you don't know if he's going to block the deception of Alec Ingle blocking or being in line blocking or cut blocking or running a route on a play action. I think that that adds a, a element of surprise and a deception. And right now I don't see Durham Smite doing it. I don't see Eric Staubert doing it. I don't see Kyler Croft doing it. I don't see Elijah Higgins doing it. Um, I don't see Eric Uzukama doing it. I don't see Miles Gaskin doing it. Maybe Chris Brooks can do it. I, if I'm Chris Brooks right now, I say, hey, um, those fullback snaps you you guys were giving uh, Alec Ingo, uh, I'd like to learn that position, please. But, yeah, it ain't. It, I think they're in trouble if they don't have Alec Ingo. I do, because I don't see them. I don't, he was my top five performer of training. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not argue, I'm not arguing any of that. But I, what I'm saying is that the offense does not require Alec Ingo to be a stud to perform. Yeah, if you want to be a pass happy offense, I want to be a balanced offense. Was it okay? Were they not a pass happy offense through eleven weeks last week when it was 
last year when it was going pretty well? Yeah, and I thought they could be better if they were a pass balance, if they were a balanced offense. Okay, again, in an ideal world, sure, you want everybody to be healthy. But to me, if I'm looking at the 11 starters on offense, if you're and you're asking me who's the one guy the team most afford can lose, Alec Ingle's pretty high up. And again, no offense, Alec Ingle, I like him and all that, but come on, he's it's a fullback. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Put some respect on Alex Ingold's name now. Um <laughs> the the real Rashad asks, in all honesty, has the Jalen Ramsey injury hurt the team's morale some? Can you tell the difference in body language? No. Not not in the remotest. Uh has it hurt the team morale? Yeah, I'm sure they're bombed. I, I don't know that they're I don't see guys like shoulders drooping and like Sad faces at practice, but yeah, it hurts every time you use a player of that caliber. Hmm. Um, oh no, no, you're not, you're not, you're not escaping that question. Your <laughs> thoughts, your thoughts. Um, people wanted to pretend that they were in a Super Bowl conversation. I did not. Um, Jalen Ramsey, I you can't even pretend that. Uh, I think the product that I'm looking at right now, top shelf without Jalen Ramsey is 10 wins. And that's completely healthy. I do oh, think Jalen Ramsey. That wasn't a question though. Yeah, I, I think it does hurt them around. I do think okay. I do I do think, you know, like Jalen Ramsey was out there balling. And yeah. it it, you know, I know it's great to see him out there without his crutches, and maybe he goes to Houston. I think it'd be ridiculous to go to Houston, but wouldn't put it past me to see him in Houston out there standing around. Um, but yes, I do think that it hurts their morale. I think that they realize they're not as good a team without Jalen Ramsey as they are with Jalen Ramsey. Okay. Why not pick up, pick up five guys to work on the O line the whole training period? to learn to work together. Why not pick the five guys? Don't get this consistent rotation. Guys can't get into a rhythm. Well, that comes from Tommy and Hylia. Tommy and Hylia, we, we we appreciate you for your illegal videos, all training camp. Um, yeah. We, illegal for us, not illegal for him. Yes, illegal for, for us, not illegal for you. You've shared with the people what they were seeing, produced all the highlights um, so that people don't have to just lean on our word. Uh, thank you for your service. Now, to answer your question, I think the plan was to have all five guys in there and everybody build chemistry and continuity. And then Liam Meikenberg was getting his face kicked in. And you kind of had no choice. You you gotta you gotta rotate it. You got you gotta you gotta move until somebody raises their hand. And I found one statement that Mike McDaniel said uh during the press conference on Sunday. Very interesting. He said, and, and and tell me if you can understand where he's coming from. He said he's going to let the locker room determine and dictate mm -hmm. when that starter has surfaced. Are they going to run a poll among the players in the locker room? I, I think he's got his leadership council. I think it's Tehran. I think it's Wilkins. I think it's Armstead. I think it's Tariq. I think it's Javon. I think it's maybe X. And that leadership council gives him a thumb up or thumbs down. And when Teron decides who his starting left guard is, that's who it's going to be. I think he would have. And since you mentioned Teron, because you mentioned the idea of having the five same guys build some chemistry. Well, you can't do that because Teron's not practicing or very little. So yeah. what you the continuity that there's been is the middle to the right side. Mm -hmm. been I, to I totally agree with you. There has been middle to the right side continuity, and Correct. that's been relatively healthy. Correct. Uh, so on the left side, I, I think the idea of, of maybe five guys together, you can make an argument that left guard, left tackle, right guard, right tackle um, is as significant. And then you have the interior offensive lineman, because I don't know exactly how much chemistry or how much cohesiveness you need between the left tackle and the right tackle, if we're going to be honest about it. Um, so once you once you understand that you're not going to have to run arms at a whole lot, I, I think if if once it was established that maybe we should open this competition up at left guard, then that superseded the idea of having the other guys working together. 
Mm-hmm. Um, John Bogle asks, how do the tight ends, how, how have the tight ends been handling their run blocking assignments, specifically everyone excepts Mike? Good question, John. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping that the the assumption is that Durham is handling it very well. Um, from what I have noticed, and I'm going to be honest, I don't necessarily stick the binoculars on the tight ends to examine how they're blocking, and I want to have the the uh, the benefit of film from practices. So, from what I'm observing, I haven't noticed anything egregious uh, in terms of missed blocks. I haven't noticed. Like I have noticed a couple of times some nice clearing blocks. I but one of them was Durham Smythe um, in practice recently. I know I, I saw Rick Sauber to have one that I remember jotting down maybe last week. I haven't noticed anything from Tyler Croft to be honest with you, even though I, that's his reputation is as a, being a good blocker. I haven't noticed anything from Elijah Higgins, but then again, he's a converted wide receiver, so that's my answer there. Yes, um, it's not good enough. That's my answer there. All of it is not good enough. Um, even uh, Durham Smite, it's not good enough. None of none of what I'm seeing at tight end is good enough. The Dolphins punted at that position all off season. You're seeing the ramifications of it right now, and it is not good enough. Not on any level. Not special teams. Not H back backup. It's it's a mismanagement of the roster. And I said what I said. Yes, you did. I, I said what I said. Yes, yes, you did. Yes, I, I said what I said. It, it is a drastic mismanagement of the roster. And it is what it is. Um, Sal, Sal Cano asks, forget Super Bowl and playoffs. Is this team looking like they can win week one? Hmm. Jesus. Holy moly. Can they win? Of course they can. Yeah. Will they? Stay tuned September 9th for our predictions. How's that? Um, again, can they? Yeah. Not an easy assignment because the Chargers are very, very, very talented, although the Chargers are known for chargery. Um, and that's defined as the ability to find different ways, diff different and unique ways of losing games they should win. They didn't do that last year against the Dolphins. Um, and in fact, you could make the argument that that was a game the Dolphins actually maybe should have won considering their passing offense and all the injuries the Chargers had in the secondary. And this is when the Chargers, Brandon Staley and Ronaldo Hill, now with the Dolphins, came up with a scheme that kind of messed up the Dolphins' timing offensively in, in the passing game. Am I wrong? And let's set the tone they set the tone for i believe what everybody else was put, picking off or was that san francisco well san francisco dropped the linebackers uh, like deep and but if you remember that game they were opportunities all over the place that was the one game where Tua was off target because he had guys open against the chargers it was not only dropping the linebackers it was taking away the middle of the field it was getting in the face of hill and waddle at the line and guys just were not open yeah that particular game. So, um, but the one advantage the Dolphins have on the other side is the Chargers have really good weapons offensively, but their offensive line generally is suspect. And the Dolphins have the potential to have a really, really good pass rush. So that's a matchup they have to exploit. This gets to our next question, which comes from Junior. Is there a game or game that you've circled as a test of how good this Dolphins team is? And I actually have two games. Let me start it off. Go ahead. Char Chargers. Number one, I need that to a Herbert matchup. Um, I need to see how the Dolphins defense plays against Herbert and how the Dolphins offense plays against uh, Chargers offense. And then Buffalo. Buffalo is going to be the gold standard for your division. Um, you got to show that you can't get bullied by the Buffalo Bills. Uh, yes, if, you if, if I'm going to go two of them, because the thing with the, with the, the first game of the season that tends to be random at times a little bit. I, I don't necessarily think it's, it's as much of a gauge as let's say week four at Buffalo for the reasons you mentioned. And the Dolphins last year, I mean, all three games were pretty much flip a coin. It could have, could have gone either way, all three of them. And then the other one, to me, the obvious one is week nine against the Chiefs in Germany. Uh, and let's see, the, let's see the Vic Fangio defense magic at work against Patrick Mahomes. 
Ooh, that sounds like a challenge to me. Um, let's get this question from Eric, who I'm a big fan of. He's got asked great questions. Is there any evidence that the Finns are going to be better at running the ball and committing to running the ball? I, I will say this. The one thing I walked away from in the exhibition season opener, the 19-3 the loss to the Atlanta Falcons is they were blowing the Falcons off the ball. And yes, you had Liam in there. Yes, you had Austin Jackson in there and 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 backups or guys, uh, you know, Isaiah Wynn. They created running lanes. And that was encouraging. If you know who Mike McDaniel is and how he worked his way up the ranks of NFL coaching, it was by being a run game specialist. That was his, that this wasn't like Adam Gase and, you know, he mentored this quarterback or mentored that quarterback. No, Mike McDaniels builds efficient, sustainable rushing attacks. And I expected that in week one. I mean, I expected that in season one, didn't really have it, kind of fell in love and became obsessed with the pass game. He saw how that can fail him in December and in the playoffs when you need your running game. And I think he's reverting back to who he is. We always go back except to we don't we except we don't know that because oh, again, I, I see it. I see it. It's training camp. Let, let's see. I think they have more see. RPOs built into their offense than than they had last year. Okay, but let's here's the thing. Let's see in the regular season when we arrive at a crossroads in a game and Mike McDaniel looks at his roster or what he has on the field. And we'll still see that the two guys are going to make the most happen are Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. Give me, give me the yardage. Give me the yardage. Give me the yardage. Give me the situation. Any of them. And that's, that's the issue we had last year is I didn't, I, I didn't, didn't like throwing the ball on third and one, which they did quite a bit. And I charted at one point and I believe they had like, one of the lowest percentage of running plays on third and one in the NFL. Uh, and the success rate wasn't necessarily that great. And I get it. It's easy to fall in love with that speed you have outside. And while I would like to think that Mike McDaniel is intelligent enough, you know, to go to, to go back to what's safer and generally better, which is running the ball. It's also very easy to go back to the default mode of oh I have those two guys outside that's and for me I want to see it before I I, I believe it. Okay, our uh, our next question comes from Killer Smurf. Uh, By the way, have we have we gotten to that question you were really looking forward to? Uh no. Um, I'm, make sure I, we get I, it in. Make sure we I, get it in. Okay, I'll, I'll get make sure I get it in. Okay. Um, do you see Liam getting moved to center this year, or is it something that we'll be doing next year? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Um, I think if the Dolphins decide that he's not panning out a left guard and he loses the starting job, yeah, I absolutely could see them toying with the idea of him at center. I, he looked apart in in the offseason right, okay. program, but in the program, program there's no there's no contact. So, um, I I think it's inevitable. Um, I think Isaiah Wynn. This is things I think. I think Isaiah Wynn is going to begin the season as a starter. I think Dan Feeney is going to begin the season on IR. And I do believe that Liam Eikenberg is going to begin the season as the backup center. Okay. Justin Pato asks, Chris Greer, Chris Greer gives you total roster control for a day. What moves do you make? Jeez. Now we've officially reached the question. Was that the question? That was the question. That's the question you were looking forward to. My yes. I mean, it's so like... I take the day off and I go to the beach. How's that? Uh, no, you, you're GM for the day. What move do you make? Do I what? What move do you make? You're GM for the day. What moves do you make? Go ahead. You first. And I'll just okay. say what you said. Glenn cooked two years, $12 million deal. Guarantee, Shocker. Shocker guarantee you go there first. Guarantee him $9 million, six this year, three next year. Obviously, if he balls out, we would restructure the situation. I think it drastically improves your team. And then I sign Akeem Hicks, four million dollars, one year, one year, one year. Um, I try to trade Emmanuel Ogba, get something for him. Hell, maybe I go get. I'm just basically unloading the contract. 
Um, and, and this is something that I could revisit at the trade deadline. Uh, but those are the moves that I would make. Um, I, and I would be scouring the, the, the 53 man roster for guys who can help me on special teams and, and, and backups. But if you're taking an all in approach, this is not an all in roster right now. And I'm sad to tell you that dolphin fans, but you know who I am. I'm not going to sell you hope. You do not have a Super Bowl team. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you have a Super Bowl team. This is a playoff team if injuries and the ball bounces right. And you get the second-year growth and a top-10 defense. They just do not have the look of a, a Super Bowl team right now. Yeah, I'm going to work in tandem with you, actually, because I, I, I'm i I'm on board with your move. Uh, I call every team who could be in need of a, of a pass rusher and – offer up Emmanuel Agba like you would. I call every team that had any kind of a need for a wide receiver and offer up Cedric Wilson along with, oh, hold on, hold on. Don't <laughs> me, no, 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 until I'm finished. Along with an offer to pick up some of his guaranteed salary. I call every team, this is a, this is after the two moves that you, that you, uh, that you, uh, that you decided to make with Dalvin Cook and Akeem Hicks. I call every team who might be in the need of a running back, Indianapolis, uh, if the Jonathan Taylor situation remains murky, okay. offer up either Raheem Mostert or Jeff Wilson Jr. in a trade. Okay. Um, and then make those in combination with signing Dalvin Cook and Akeem Hicks with the same premise as you that we're going for it. Let's go for it. Yeah. I, I do not disagree with any of the moves that you make. Um Unfortunately, I do believe I remember and, and fans like when we tell old stories. So uh, I'm going to share an old story. Um, I remember coming off the 2016 playoff year um, where they had the unicorns. And mm -hmm. I remember I was so excited for that year and so excited for that roster and the return of Ryan Tannehill. And I thought they were going to build off what they did 11 and five that season. Correct. One no, six, one six. 10 and six. Yes. I thought they were going to take a step forward. And I remember having a conversation with, uh, with, with Chris Greer, who clearly had been reading the things that I had written. And he was basically like, yeah, calm down. We're not that good. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like there are holes on this roster. We're not that good. And I, it was like a, it was like a slap in the face, a reality check. And he was looking at the roster in totality. And that things had bounced right for them that year. And there was no guarantee that things were going to bounce right for them every year. And I can't help but think back at that and think back at this roster that I'm looking at. And I don't know who sold it to you that you had a Super Bowl team. Because I can't look at this team and think Super Bowl. I just can't. It's not there. And I can't, I can't make myself believe it. Um, and it's not that the offense is seemingly having some growing pains right now. It's that, and this is something that I knew going into the process. I don't like the, t the depth anywhere. There's like, okay, quarterback. I'm okay with it, but I'm, I, I, and I've said this. If you're starting your backup quarterback, the season is done. Like. Again, you can say that in. You can. In the, in the NFL. With the exception of five teams, you say you say that sentence and it's accurate. Correct. So, and speaking, if you can, if you can, if you can say that you lose your your starting quarterback, no big deal. Chances are your starting quarterback sucks. <laughs> I mean, or or it's you know. Um, yeah. But here's the thing though about the 2016, and I'm. If you remember that year. Dolphins had this amazing. First of all, they had a really easy schedule based on the previous years. Right? I know you don't you don't want to hear it, but that's just a fact. Number two, you play the schedule. Whoever's that's fine. That's fine. Every they were the anti Chargers that year. They kept coming up with big play at the end to to pull out wins in tight games. Whether it was Kenyon Drake kickoff return for touchdowns against the Jets, Kiko Alonso pick six against the Chargers. Uh, I mean, it was on and on and on. It just wouldn't stop. Um, and then they went to the playoffs and they got spanked by Pittsburgh. And I would make the argument that 
while I'm not sure that I would certainly wouldn't declare the Dolphins a Super Bowl team, but this team coming back, especially once you add Vic Fangio and Jalen Ramsey, a hell of a lot better than what the Dolphins had coming back in 2017. I mean, it's not even close. Um, so, because to me right now, if your biggest issue on defense, for example, is that you don't have depth, Okay, look at look at a, all the, the the contenders. Is there any other team that doesn't have either depth concerns or a bigger issue? I mean, so he's on the defense. To, correct on defense to me, and on offense, the the biggest issue is which one is the more real Dolphins offense, the one that was smoking everybody through eleven games, or the one that really struggled on the stretch. So that's to me, that to me is the biggest question. If we're going to look at what kind of team will the Dolphins have in 2023? Brady and Yamira. Y-A-R-E-M-A. Uh, sorry if I butchered your name. What do you want to see in the next few preseason games? Nobody getting hurt. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, Continuity. Isaiah Wynn working with the starting unit. Um, them continuing to burrow open running lanes. Um, I want to see a effective game plan that gets me into the red zone and, and converts a, a touchdown. I want to see tight ends step up. I want to see it, linebackers, inside linebackers, make impact plays. Um, that's really what I want to see. Um, I want to see a safety step forward and say, this is my job. I, I don't... I don't see that right now. Um, All of the above, to me, below, nobody else gets hurt. Ooh. Sean asked a good question. Can you describe what you think good depth is, an example from another team, and if it's actually attainable at every position? It's not attainable at every position. It's no. not because of the constraints of the salary cap. You just can't – you could, just can't have a stud up behind a stud. That just doesn't happen. Um, I'll give you an example of quality depth. I know you we don't like you don't like Emmanuel Agba as a, as an as an edge defender. To me, right now, if he's your third behind Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb, something happens to Chubb or Phillips, you stick in Emmanuel Agba, and that's quality depth. Okay, right? See quality depth, but that's quality depth. Mm -hmm. That's what we're that's that's what I'm talking about. Um. But again, for every team, if you have stars, there's going to be a drop off. I, I think I think running back is a, is a perfect example of quality depth. But you, what you did was you re-signed all four who have done things in the NFL, and then you went in and drafted one. Cornerback for, uh, is another example. Before all these injuries, which is why you need a lot of cornerbacks, you had quality depth. Right now, you don't have a nickel cornerback behind Cater Kohu, which is why he's locked into that nickel cornerback position. Um, depth will be challenged by injuries, and it takes a good quality evaluation department in order to kind of address those, scouting and, and evaluation department in order to address those and, and the proper fits. Mitchell Agude is a perfect example of good evaluation. Nobody at UM saw Mitchell Agude and said, oh, he's an NFL talent. He's an NFL player. I can tell you right now, there's no drop-off between Mitchell Agude and Malik Reed, even though Malik Reed is a more accomplished, more polished pass rusher. Cameron Good, who was a draft pick, we would both agree that Mitchell Agude is ahead of him, correct? Yeah, I'm not, not so sure. Okay. All right. That's fair. Um, but But – but the fact that, you know, you have those, the, the, it's got to be tough decisions. It's got to be tough decisions. Uh, that's Omar, the example of quality depth. Omar, I, I apologize. I'm going to jump in here. We want to end this this uh, podcast smoothly, as smoothly as possible. That's going to be it. We're going to be heading on a plane, heading to Houston. We will we'll be recapping the two practices from Houston. And Omar, see you on the plane. See you.